Thank you, Janice, and thank you all for inviting me uh, to uh, this uh, special event. It's been an opportunity for me uh, not just to talk about uh, early childhood education and especially what's going on in the neighboring state of Oklahoma, but also to learn from you. And I attended a couple sessions this morning and learned a lot about uh, what's going on here in, in Arkansas. Uh, while I'm uh, thinking of that, let me just mention, someone this morning referred to a love of learning as uh, one of the things that uh, we really hope our students will acquire uh, when they're in school. And um, I thought you might like to know, if you didn't know already, that, uh, that NOVA is actually going to have a special this evening on the School of the Future. And I had the privilege of seeing a little snippet of this a couple days ago at, uh, at an event in Washington, D.C., and it looks wonderful. And I think there's some very inspiring stories of students like Candace from a tough neighborhood in Philadelphia who um, was suspended from school uh, for fighting and uh, went to a new school and managed to turn her life around thanks to a school that uh, captured her imagination. And so anyway, uh, if I, I'm going to be flying uh, back to <laughs> back to Washington, D.C. when this is on, uh, but uh, you can have the privilege of watching this. It looks like a great show. All right. So thank you again for inviting me. And uh, I'm going to talk about early childhood education. Uh, and maybe the best way to start is that most of us have some real life experiences from early childhood education. And um, uh, this suggests that some kids may actually not be totally excited by their first encounter with our educational system. But I can recall as a parent of a preschooler how, uh, how I felt when I showed up to pick my daughter and she didn't want to come home with me. And I said, wow. This is, a, this is really a great program. Um, there's a lot of brain science and neuroscience work that attests to the vital importance of what happens during the earliest years in life. This is really when the cells and the synapses are growing at breathtaking speed. It's when the architecture of the brain is being formed and so these early years are of vital importance. They're of vital importance, uh, so much so that it's really seeping into our popular culture. And uh, parents are aware of it, uh, as they were not aware of it uh, before. Um, and parents are aware, I think, as they should be, of the great potential uh, that uh, early learning has for their kids. You know, we, we some, as adults who spend a lot of time thinking and uh, wrestling with problems, uh, we uh, sometimes think of ourselves as superior learners. But uh, there's actually some research by Allison Gopnik, uh, a child psychologist at UC Berkeley, that uh, points out, uh, yes, adults are very good at uh, learning and remembering the tried and the true, but young children are very good at the weird and the wonderful. Uh, they are not encumbered by the baggage that the rest of us have. And so they are capable of fresh insights and discoveries. Four-year-olds are very capable of theorizing. Now, their conception of theorizing might look different from your conception or, or my conception. Um, Four-year-olds are capable of understanding principles of physics. I think, for example, of a preschool program in Hopkins, Minnesota where the teacher decided to set up some ramps and got some colorful balls and invited the students to see if they could get the balls to land more quickly. And within a very short period of time, these four-year-olds 
had figured out the relationship between slope and velocity. Now they may not have been able to articulate it, but a rudimentary understanding of it was there and that's something that, that they and their teachers can build on into the future. So, um, you heard this morning uh, from, uh, from Corey from uh, Forward Arkansas, not just the importance of preschool, but in particular, the importance of high quality preschool. There are many studies that show that quality matters. And incidentally, uh, there are increasingly studies that show that we can define quality with some precision. Quality matters for all children. It matters especially for disadvantaged children. And so as we design pre-K programs, it's very important for us to recognize that simply establishing a pre-K program is not enough. We have to be very attentive to the design of these programs so that they're going to meet our children's needs and our society's needs uh, for a very exciting but very complex future. So. Uh, effective interventions for young children reduce risks and improve developmental outcomes. Um, it's a sad fact of life that uh, many of our poorest children uh, experience toxic stress uh, due to unfortunate family circumstances and sometimes due to unfortunate community circumstances. A strong pre-kindergarten program uh, cannot undo the damage that has been done by those extreme difficulties. But it can give these kids a fighting chance to find some coping skills, to find some self-confidence uh, that will enable them to build a better life. So what's going on in the nation? There's actually been what I like to call a quiet revolution that's taken place in the United States. Uh, roughly over the past decade or so. If you look at the time period, for example, from 2002 to 2012, just 10 years later, the percentage of four-year-olds enrolled in state-funded pre-kindergarten programs has actually doubled. So this has been uh, a seismic shift in the way we think about early childhood education in America we've seen a dramatic increase in children's access to state-funded pre-kindergarten programs. It's leveled off a little bit uh, in part uh, because of the recession and in part because of other worthy public policy goals. But uh, there's ample evidence uh, that uh, public officials uh, and parents are still very, very interested and expanding pre-K. Uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, some states are farther ahead of the curve uh, than others. And uh, as you can tell from uh, Arkansas's color, which in this case happens to be pink, uh, you folks uh, are ahead of the curve, just as Oklahoma, which I will be talking about in, in a moment or so, is ahead of the curve. Um, these are some statistics from the National Institute for Early Education Research, NEAR, that uh, put what's going on in Arkansas uh, in perspective. And I think what's striking is that uh, you've done uh, a rather good job compared to other states in making uh, pre-K available to uh, four-year-olds and especially to three-year-olds, uh, which is uh, increasingly important. Uh, this gives you some sense of how those uh, services are delivered. And let me just say that um, choosing the right mix of service delivery organizations is an art rather than a science. Uh, it's not absolutely clear what the best strategy is. And in some ways, the best strategy is what fits the culture of your state. So uh, the Georgia pre-K program has a mixed services delivery system and they seem to be doing a very fine job of delivering high quality 
pre-K services in their state. Uh, Oklahoma has opted instead for a school-based pre-K delivery system, and that seems to be working very fine in Oklahoma. So I don't think one size fits all. I think each state should find its own path, and this is just one example of it. So let me talk a little bit about Oklahoma's pre-K program. Oklahoma established a universal pre-K program in 1998 through uh, an act of the state legislature. Uh, universal is not mandatory, it is voluntary. All that universal means is that all four-year-olds uh, should have access to a state-funded pre-K program, not that all four-year-olds must attend a state pre-K program. The Oklahoma program is funded uh, through the school aid formula, which was tweaked back in 1998 by the state legislature. As I mentioned, public schools are the primary service delivery organizations, but there are opportunities for other organizations to participate. So in many communities in Oklahoma, including in Tulsa, you find that the Head Start programs are active participants. And what that means in practice is that the Head Start programs are getting federal dollars and they're also getting state dollars, which uh, if used wisely can actually create very special programs. Uh, and I'm happy to discuss the Head Start experience in uh, Tulsa if you're interested in that. It's important to stress that in the Oklahoma version of the pre-K program, all lead teachers must have a bachelor's degree and they must be early childhood certified. This gets to the quality dimension, which is very important. It's also important to stress that in the Oklahoma version of pre-K, that uh, pre-K teachers are paid exactly uh, what other teachers in the public school system are paid. They're on the same wage scale. And so that has enabled Oklahoma from the very beginning to uh, attract some uh, very talented individuals, not just into the teaching profession, but into the early childhood education profession. So, since I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about what's going on in Tulsa, let me describe briefly the, uh, the demographics of the Tulsa Public Schools for the cohort that I'm going to be focusing on with you here today. Um, of the eligible students at the time, 40% uh, of them were enrolled in the school-based pre-K program and another 11% were enrolled in the Head Start program, which was receiving funds from the state of Oklahoma. Uh, at the time, about three out of every four students in Tulsa Public Schools was receiving a free or reduced price lunch. And this gives you a sense of the uh, astonishing diversity of the student body at the time. Uh, so there was substantial representation in the student body for uh, white students, black students, Hispanic students, uh, and even Native American students. And this was uh, important to us as researchers because we wanted to see how different kinds of students fared under this high quality pre-K program. So, uh, one of the first things that we did for students who were enrolled in the Tulsa pre-K program in the 2005-06 school year was to visit their classrooms. We visited just about every classroom in the Tulsa Public Schools system and we systematically observed what was going on. One of the observational instruments we used is something called CLASS, which is now widely used, uh, certainly by Head Start and by many other programs. It originated with Bob Pianta at the University of Virginia, and it enables you to measure uh, what's going on inside the classroom in terms of instructional support by the teacher, and also in terms of emotional support. What we found when we visited Tulsa's 
uh, pre-K classrooms is that the level of instructional support was relatively high. When I say relatively high, I mean compared to data we had uh, from 11 other states of some school-based programs in those states. So we know from the research we did using the class instrument in Tulsa and from the research that other scholars at the University of North Carolina did using the same instrument focusing on school-based pre-K programs in 11 other states that the level of instructional support in Tulsa was relatively high. Just one important indicator of high quality. Uh, we also took a look at how much time was actually being devoted to academic instruction. And we found that a substantial amount of time was being devoted to reading skills, uh, which we heard from uh, Scott this morning, or fundamental, uh, and also uh, math skills, and even science. So here too, when we compared our data from Tulsa with uh, what we found in the 11 other states, we found uh, tangible evidence that the teachers were devoting considerable time on task to core academic subjects. So we have uh, actually studied the Tulsa public schools pre-K program on several occasions. And this is uh, from the data we obtained in the fall of 2006, which gives you the effect sizes, which is a measure of program impact. And uh, those effect sizes essentially measure uh, pre-reading skills as exemplified by scores on letter word identification in the Woodcock-Johnson test. Pre-writing skills as measured by uh, spelling test scores in the Woodcock-Johnson test. And pre-math skills as measured by applied problems. So those were our indicators from a nationally normed test, which is Woodcock-Johnson. Uh, just to put those effect sizes in, in perspective, uh, Cohen has suggested, very roughly speaking, that when you have uh, an effect size of 0.2, uh, it's a small impact. If you have an effect size of 0.5, it's a medium impact. An effect size of 0.8 is large. Uh, as you can see, what we were finding in Tulsa was medium to large impacts uh, on school readiness, and specifically, on cognitive development. So to translate this into plain English, we have another way of presenting exactly the same data from exactly the same point in time. We can say that if students attended the pre-K program, uh, they are nine months ahead of their peers who did not attend the program in their pre-reading skills, seven months ahead of their peers in their pre-writing skills, and five months ahead of their peers in their pre-math skills. So that is, in plain English, a way of capturing or condensing, if you will, the kinds of learning gains they've experienced. We took a closer look at the results uh, for students from different social classes. And what we found in a nutshell was A, all students are benefiting, uh, including middle class students. But that disadvantaged students, which is to say students receiving a free lunch, benefit more. So all students benefit, but the more acutely disadvantaged students benefit more. Okay, so that's just uh, some of our findings from the Tulsa program on school readiness. And let me say in passing, since I know at least one of you is interested in social-emotional development, we also looked at uh, possible effects on social-emotional development. And um, we did find some modest positive effects. Uh, and specifically, we found that the students who are in the Tulsa pre-K program, the school-based program, 
were more attentive and that they were less timid uh, than their peers. So there were some modest, short-term social-emotional effects in addition to these bigger, more dramatic cognitive effects that we focused on so much. So what's going on in some other states? Well, uh, there are any number of states that are worth looking at. One of them is New Jersey, which has a, uh, a targeted uh, pre-K program uh, as a result of a court order. This is a, an unusual uh, situation because most uh, state-funded pre-K programs were mandated by the state legislature. The New Jersey uh, pre-K program was mandated by the New Jersey State Supreme Court in a series of rulings known as the Abbott versus Burke rulings. So this is a very high quality program uh, by any, anyone's uh, reckoning. And here are some early results from Steve Barnett and his colleagues in New Jersey looking at the short run effects uh, of the New Jersey Abbott Schools uh, program. And you can see that those short term effects uh, can probably best be characterized as uh, small to moderate. Um, Georgia. Uh, Georgia, as I mentioned, has a mixed services delivery model. I don't think I explicitly said that Georgia has a universal pre-K system, but they do. And it's funded by the state lottery, uh, which also funds uh, college scholarships, uh, incidentally. So, the, the lottery funds uh, the, the older students and the younger students. Uh, the work in New Jersey was done mainly by Gary Henry, at least at first, and uh, this gives you some sense of, of what he was finding during his early research in Georgia. Specifically, you can see where the children stood with respect to national norms uh, before they began the pre-K program. And then you can see over time where they stood, uh, having benefited from the pre-K program. And you can see that uh, whereas in three or four indicators they were below national norms before uh, participating in pre-K, uh, a year or a year and a half later, they were generally being uh, they were generally above national norms. The Massachusetts uh, pre-K program in Boston has received a lot of attention. And uh, this is uh, a very high quality program which has uh, a, a couple features that are worth mentioning given this morning's discussion. There's a lot of emphasis on mentoring here or coaching of teachers. And I have to say that uh, we did not see that in Tulsa or in Oklahoma. You do see that in Boston. It costs more money to do that. Um, but it may be a, a very good idea because it means that the teachers are getting some real-time feedback from master teachers who have uh, a wealth of experience and who have some great ideas and insights and suggestions that they can share. The results in Boston are very encouraging. Again, thinking of the effect sizes, you can see here that the effect sizes are moderate in size. And, you know, that's really in many ways a big accomplishment. Uh, so the, the Boston pre-K program seems to be producing very impressive uh, impacts on cognitive development, uh, not just uh, verbal skills, but math skills. And incidentally, it's also producing some modest positive impacts on social emotional skills and specifically on executive functioning skills. That's something that we were not able to measure uh, in Tulsa. It's something that uh, Professor Weiland and Professor Yoshikawa were able to measure. And so far, the returns uh, on that front are encouraging. Um, less encouraging are the results from Tennessee, which I'll talk about uh, a couple times today. Uh, Tennessee has uh, a, 
uh, targeted pre-K program like so many of the other states, uh, including, uh, of course, Arkansas. Um, and in the short run, the results actually looked uh, pretty good. So if you look at this uh, chart, which comes from the Vanderbilt University study of Tennessee's pre-K program, you'll see that in the short run, they found uh, modest to moderate uh, positive effects on this uh, range of indicators, all focusing on cognition. I'll have more to say about Tennessee in a moment. So, a big question for researchers and for public officials, uh, now that it's quite clear that uh, high quality pre-K programs can move the needle and enhance school readiness is, do those short-term effects persist over time or do they fade out or even disappear? That's a big question uh, for a variety of reasons. It's, it's a more complicated question methodologically, so it's a more daunting challenge for researchers to try to get a handle on that question. But we decided to take a crack at it, and some other researchers across the country are taking a crack at that same question, which is great. Um, so, uh, it, just a quick summary of that literature as I read that literature. Uh, evidence from multiple states and cities shows short-term gains. I could have given you additional examples of that. Uh, they all pretty much reach the same conclusion on short-term gains. Evidence from multiple sites in multiple states shows fade out over time. That is a consistent finding. Uh, fade out is a fact of life. Uh, and incidentally, it's not unique to early childhood education interventions. It's, it's a, a, a facet of many other interventions. You're going to see some diminution of effects over time. Um, evidence from multiple sites does, however, show longer term gains, with the notable exception of Tennessee. So this is one chart that comes from a, a careful analysis by researchers at the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. Uh, what it does, in effect, is to show first what the short-term impacts were uh, for lots and lots of different studies combined, and then to show how that diminishes over time. And you can see that uh, there is a rapid diminution in the impact once you get beyond year one. And then it sort of tapers off uh, after that for the average study. This is multiple studies combined. Uh, so that you're left with uh, an ultimate effect size of maybe 0.08 or something in that region, which would be considered a small or modest effect size. So that's from lots of different studies. Some studies yield higher uh, gains, other studies yield smaller gains. Uh, th this is a, a longer term study from New Jersey, which we looked at earlier. And uh, for the moment, why don't you just focus on the blue, because that's pretty much your, uh, your typical state-funded pre-K program, which is to say it's a one-year program. So that gives you the the longer term sustained effects uh, of New Jersey's one year program uh, as of um, fourth grade or fifth grade. And I think you could say those effects are uh, relatively modest, but they are also pretty clear. Uh, the effects of the two year version of that same program in the longer run are more dramatic. So at least based on the New Jersey research, you get the impression that dosage does matter. And if you can have a, a high quality pre-K program that lasts not just one year, but two years, uh, you have the very real possibility of generating even more long-lasting impacts on children's 
cognitive development. And that's what they're looking at here, just as it's what most researchers have focused on, cognitive development. Now this is something from, from our research, and uh, this is research that we did uh, to try to see what was going on in third grade. And so if you look at the, the, first, uh, the first set of findings over to the left, that tells you using propensity score matching what our earliest results were. And then you can see that uh, as of third grade, the effect sizes had diminished, but that the math effects were still statistically significant. So there was definitely fade out. There was also definitely persistence. Now, this comes from the state of Tennessee. In Tennessee, they had uh, short-term effects that were positive and statistically significant, as we have already seen. But you can see uh, almost immediately those effects disappeared. And then, astonishingly, it also appears that you are getting some negative effects. Uh, I should say that's uh, extremely unusual, and thus far the researchers haven't offered a, a compelling explanation for that, but they're looking into it. Now this is, is my own summary of several different studies to try to put uh, both our study in Oklahoma and the Tennessee study in perspective. Uh, what this suggests is short-term gains all the time, fade out all the time, persistence most of the time. So based on my reading of the data available from multiple states, I would say uh, I don't quarrel with the results in Tennessee. I believe those researchers are very meticulous, very careful, and so I trust their findings but I would say that's an outlier. So that's certainly inconsistent with the results that researchers have come up with in other states. Now ultimately what we want to do is to take some of these findings from uh, empirical research and try to convert it into some numbers that might be a little more meaningful to state legislators than these cryptic effect size measures that I've alluded to in my comments to you. And uh, so uh, here again we get some helpful uh, assistance from the folks at the Washington State Institute for Public Policy who've done this uh, meta-analysis. And uh, based on their meta-analysis of multiple studies conducted at different points in time, they conclude that on average the benefits of pre-K are likely to exceed the costs by about four to one. Now I'm going to put my own asterisk next to that. Uh, personally, I think that's probably a little high for large-scale programs in the United States today. And I say that because this includes not just some of the uh, large-scale programs that I've alluded to, um, but also uh, some of the legendary boutique programs like the Perry Preschool study and the Abbasidarian study that some of you may have heard about, which served a very, very small number of children, which served extremely disadvantaged children, and which served those children uh, 35 or 40 years ago when, uh, frankly, the, the situation for the counterfactual or the control group kids was dramatically different. Today, thanks to government public policies at the federal, state, and local levels, uh, children who don't have access to a state-funded pre-K program do nevertheless have access to certain other forms of support, including, in some instances, child care subsidies, home visiting programs, and other wonderful programs that uh, benefit disadvantaged kids in particular. So, you know, only time will tell. We'll have a better sense of this uh, perhaps in 10 years, but public officials have to act today. And what I would say with some confidence is I believe that the benefits of a high quality pre-K program uh, are almost certain to exceed the costs. So they may not uh, yield a ratio of four to one, it might be closer to two to one, but that would still be a great investment for public officials to make. So. Uh, there are objections that have been raised 
to proposals for either establishing or expanding pre-K at the state level. One of those objections is that uh, to do so uh, would be a mistake because the evidence on pre-K effects is mixed. Uh, and let me skip ahead. Um, the evidence on pre-K effects on school readiness is not mixed. So uh, I think if people make that assertion, make sure that you figure out what they're saying. Are they talking about short-term effects or long-term effects? The evidence on short-term effects is crystal clear. There's just no meaningful uh, difference among researchers on that point. Um, participation in a high-quality pre-K program does boost reading skills and it does boost math skills in the short run. What about the objection that pre-K effects fade out over time? Well, as we've seen, many studies do show fade out, but they also show long-term positive impacts on a number of important outcomes. You see this, for example, in the Chicago Child Parent Center studies, the work that's been done by Art Reynolds over the years, uh, which attests to higher uh, high school graduation rates, higher college attendance rates, higher adult earnings, and more favorable criminal justice outcomes for children who've participated in that program. We're still learning more about longer term effects, and I think we should try to keep an open mind about those effects. But uh, as I read the evidence, it suggests that a high quality pre-K program uh, can in fact produce longer term gains, even if they are less dramatic than the short term gains. Now you sometimes hear this objection that states with strong pre-K programs have had disappointing uh, NAEP scores. And uh, I think that's a, that's a valid point as far as it goes in the sense that uh, states like uh, Georgia and Oklahoma, which have universal pre-K programs, do have disappointing NAEP scores. So I think that is true enough. On the other hand, you can't really use NAEP scores to assess the efficacy of a particular educational policy intervention. To do so would be to commit what uh, one researcher has called a misnapery, a word that you will not find in your, in your dictionary, but a misnapery means to misuse NAEP statistics. Uh, you cannot use NAEP statistics to determine how effective uh, Oklahoma's universal pre-K program has been. And that's because, yes, they do have this amazing universal pre-K program, but they also have a very high poverty population. They also have uh, a severely underfunded public school system. Their K through 12 system uh, ranks 49th in the nation in terms of uh, expenditure levels. And they have had, as Arkansas has had, a changing demographics that some other states haven't. So uh, in both Oklahoma and Georgia, you have seen a very sharp increase in Hispanic uh, students and in English language learners. You cannot possibly evaluate the effectiveness of an early childhood intervention uh, on NAEP scores or any other educational outcome uh, unless you take those uh, important contextual factors into account. So finally, you sometimes hear that we cannot afford to spend more money on pre-K. And uh, I, I, I do actually think that uh, you know, legislators should think uh, long and hard about how they invest scarce public dollars. So that's a... By, for sure, a legitimate uh, point to raise. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the evidence to date suggests that the benefits of pre-K uh, do exceed the costs, and it seems to me that given some of our problems as a society, that this is a great investment uh, for us to make. And I say that because the United States is lagging in its own educational outcomes, uh, at this point, we're competing with, uh, we're not really competing uh, with, uh, with China 
or uh, with, uh, uh, with, uh, with Japan or Singapore or Korea. We're c competing with Poland and Estonia. I don't think those are our aspirational peers. And uh, so I think that if we want to see stronger economic growth, that uh, pre-K is one very important foundation uh, that state public officials can take in order to promote that outcome. So what have we learned? High quality pre-K enhances cognitive development in the short run. It enhances social and emotional development in the short run. It improves long-term adult outcomes. And it's an excellent investment in the next generation. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions.